In accordance with Ohio Revised Code Section 121.22, I hereby call the May 11th, 2022 meeting of the Bexley Board of Education to order. Kyle, will you call the roll, please? Dr. Baker. Here. Dr. Jade. Here. Ms. Mitchell. Here. Ms. Pickrell. Here. Ms. Powers. Here. Thank you. Um, I think we have people who are here for public participation this evening as we work to ensure that our public participation section is responsive to our community's needs as well as those of the boards to conduct business in an orderly and efficient manner. We ask that those wishing to speak a public com comment sign up at the podium at the beginning of the meeting. Is there anyone here who wants to speak in public comment and hasn't signed up yet? Great, Kyle, would you mind pulling the sheet there? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Chase, yeah. Ten percent. Thank you. And we start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic which extends one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next item on our agenda is approval of our minutes of the April meeting. Uh, everybody's had a chance to review those. Are there any uh, comments or corrections on the minutes? If not, can I have a motion to approve the minutes? And so moved. Thank you. Second? Second. Great. All in favor of approving the minutes, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Thank you. And next is approval of our agenda. May I have a motion to approve the agenda? So move. Thank you. A second? Second. Are there any changes, comments, or questions on the agenda? All in favor of approval of the agenda, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is actually an executive session. A, board, a public board of education may hold an executive session upon a majority vote of the board by a roll call vote for consideration of any of certain enumerated matters. Our executive session today is to consider the employment of public employees and the investigation of complaints against public employees. So it's A2 and A8 on our resolution document. May I have a motion to enter into executive session for those purposes? So moved. Thank you, and a second? Second. Thank you. Kyle, would you please call the roll on that? Ms. Mitchell. Yes, we're here. Sorry, I forgot what I was Dr. saying. Dr. Baker. Yes. Dr. Jade. Here. Ms. Pickrell. Yes. <laughs> Ms. Powers. Aye. I started a trend. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. We're going to go into the back and we will be back shortly. Feels better in here.
Okay, can I have a motion to reconvene our meeting, please? So moved. Thank you, and a second? Second. Kyle, do we need a roll call on that or can we just? To reconvene is just a, uh, not a roll call, but. Okay, thank you. Call. So all in favor of reconvening, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, that motion carries. Next item is board updates. Um, my two areas are first legislative liaison to the OSBA. Later in our meeting, we will have the opportunity to consider a resolution um, concerning an opposition to House Bills 322, 327, and 616, which are bills that I've reported on in recent meetings. I don't have any other updates, so I will save any comments on that for that portion of the agenda. Superintendent's Policy Committee. I'm really grateful to the team that has helped us as we continue to work through policy updates. We're working hard to get through some additional policies that we hope to bring to the board next month and beyond. Um, we have only one policy that's new that's on the agenda for our first read tonight, DBDA, the Cash Balance Reserve. This is a policy that Mr. Smith has brought to the board and he um, took it through his finance committee, I believe, and then um, the superintendent's policy committee has taken a look at it. Um, uh, Dr. Fine, Mr. Braxton, Joanne and I, um, and we've got a bunch of others that we have looked at on a first reading and we'll do a second reading of those tonight. Um, we have a superintendent's policy committee meeting tomorrow. In addition, I'm just reporting that there's a PTO council meeting scheduled for next week. Finally, I want to congratulate our graduating senior, Quinn Hall. He has been an outstanding contributor, uh, has been a great voice for us, for the students, and it's been super helpful. He worked hard to bring us information about what was going on and how the students were reacting to policies and, and resolutions. And, um, that was hard work and really, really appreciated, along with all the other more fun things that he's talked to us about. So, Quinn, congratulations and great gratitude to you for what you've done for us. Thank you. Any questions for me? Okay, Alicia, turn to you. Yes. So, uh, Bexley Education Foundation's final meeting will be on the 18th at 7 p.m. So, I'll report out in June uh, that. Um, I will be rolling off as um, a board of governors specifically because I serve dual roles on that um, board as I was serving before coming back to school board, but I will maintain my, my board commitments, of course, uh, but they like to um, place a, a person um, on their board of governors instead of holding double seats. So it makes sense. Um, Finance Advisory Council, uh, as you already noted, uh, Mr. Smith has um, a policy for us to review. We had a lengthy conversation over um, this recommendation that Mr. Smith uh, is, is making for us today um, with the group, as well as talking about upcoming facility uh, growth and needs and improvements for the district. So um, that was a, a really robust conversation that just sort of tipped the iceberg. I think we're going to kick that back over to the facilities group when that when that convenes. Um, uh, understanding that there will be some overlap. Um, we also had a pretty lengthy discussion about uh, upcoming levy and um, what that might look like for the community because um, it feels like forever ago, but in 2019, we, we um, talked to our community about uh, potentially coming back to the levy in 2023, um, but we're 22, sorry, <laughs> losing track of the years, 2022, but obviously with all of the um, additional dollars uh, that we've collected in tax revenue, as well as uh, some of the COVID relief funds that's been able to be uh, pushed off. Uh, we talked about what the challenges were with um, the delay that we had the last time, a nine-year gap between levies and, and how that um, impacts community perception and understanding. Uh, and so we will, um, we're, we're, we haven't square set on a, a date or a year, uh, but uh, Mr. Smith provided the group with several um, scenarios 
of when we might come forward. So we'll continue to report out that report out to that as it gets a little more detailed. Um, and then facilities hasn't met, but uh, I sat on my last final Livingston Avenue Steering Committee um, as not only a, a Livingston Avenue resident, but also a steering, also a school board member. Uh, and those um, findings and recommendations were accepted by majority vote for the group to go to the next step. Uh, really exciting uh, stuff to the Livingston Avenue corridor. So we'll be excited to hear how that impacts going forward. And that's all I have today. Any questions for Ms. Mitchell? Thank you. I don't know what our order is here. Mr. Baker. Hey, how you doing? All right, there you go. Um, so th with the athletic board, uh, a couple of things. Um, we talked about the uh, different policies and you, we're gonna see those later on today as well. Um, academic integrity and uh, substance abuse. And so those got kind of edited and sent forward for us to review here at the board. Um, we also looked at the um, uh, athletic handbook as well. So those are going, going to come before the board. And then one kind of positive announcement, I guess, is that I got from the boosters that they had the, their most successful uh, mulch sale to date. So you saw a bunch of people a couple weeks ago with uh, bags of mulch and different high school uh, teams uh, working together and U-Haul trucks throughout Bexley. Uh, that was them raising some some great funds for our students. And then with the financial report, uh, Alicia talked about most of it already and also uh, earlier as well. So we're going to hold off on a levy for uh, this year. Uh, some of the reasons were discussed earlier about the pandemic funds that are coming forward. And um, so there's no need to discuss that further. And then, of course, there's a, a policy about the cash balance. And, and so Bex is in pretty great shape, pretty good shape as far as cash balance is concerned. Um, but, uh, you know, so we could hold off longer and watch the cash balance go down a little bit, make the levy millage go up. So there's that kind of seesaw that we talked about. Um, but uh, for right now, uh, we're going to hold off on fall uh, with, a, with a levy for this year because we're in good shape. So that's it. Great. Thank you. Any questions from Ms. Dr. Baker? Uh, Dr. Baker, I have a quick question. I saw that you had um, for the athletic board. Could you go back, back? a slide? Yeah. Oh. Did did they vote already for that division membership with B Bishop Reed? No, 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 no. That is that is and not. I know that there was some something with um, what is it? Harvest Prep. Did they accept them into the division? Uh, I think it's all just discussion right now. Yeah, discussion. I think it's next week. Oh, it is. Yep. Okay. All right. And just a, an update, the academic integrity and substance abuse, we're still processing that, working through that. That'll be on probably the June agenda. Okay. Thanks. Right. Yes. Perfect. Great. Okay. Next is um, Ms. Jade, Dr. Jade. Um, we had an April 16th meeting. And I... The way I sort of try to organize these is, you know, what are people talking about in all the districts and where their energies think you being expended. Um, there was lots of conversations about the House bills 322, 327, and 616, and the different ways that districts and or schools or students were responding to it. So there were some who, like us, were writing resolutions that included all of them. Some of them were writing resolutions just for 616, some who were shying away from all of it. So there was quite a range, but that was a big part of the conversation. Um, and uh, it was great because Gehanna was willing to share their draft. And so that was sort of helpful, I think, in the process. And I know Victoria worked really hard to, to put ours together. There was a lot of conversation about wellness and the trends around mental health and the need for social emotional development. Several different schools working on sort of thinking through facilities, thinking through um, their levy choices that they're trying to do and then this ongoing conversation about the voucher law. So different districts sort of talking about different things, but those were sort of the trends that most districts were talking about to some degree or another. Um, the state's uh, board of education has a superintendent search going on. There was a bit of conversation about this dyslexia guidebook, which I think Melissa spoke to somebody, or uh, Colleen maybe spoke to last time, um, that something that we're taking into account, yeah as we're looking at that in, in the ELA adoption. Um, and then, you know, she spoke again, this is the second month where they spoke again to sort of organizational challenges 
um, organized challenges or threats towards board members that are happening, um, sort of public threats. So those were something that else that came up. And I didn't make a slide for this because I'm not almost as cool as Jonathan, but not quite, um, was we have the strategic planning is the other committee that I'm on. And we have started the process of, of looking at potential consultants to support that process, but it's just beginning to have conversations. So not, not it hasn't exploring options. So I should have made a separate slide for that. Question? I'm curious how many of the, um, what are there 13 districts in the Franklin County Alliance? I think 13 or 15. It's there are a lot of districts. Not everybody has um, somebody who a representative. Yeah. Oh, okay. I was just curious how many of the 13 or so, however many there are, um, how how many of them had an interest to do a joint resolution. You know, sometimes. Um, that did not come up. Hmm. I don't remember. There's 12, 12 of the different districts have some representation. Not everybody's there at every meeting. Mm -hmm. But that was not. Um, I don't. I don't think that came up. Do you remember that coming up? No, I. I didn't come up, and it it's was an interesting question. Challenging to do that, you yeah. know. Like having sat on that committee, I understand. Yeah, just because you don't have all of the board members there, you have one or two. Right. Um, so, for so. example, just to further the conversation, um, Colum one of the. Um, documents that we looked at in preparing that resolution is Columbus City's um, statement. That's not a board, theirs isn't a board statement, it's a statement of their leadership team. And so there, there are several ways to do it. And one is just, to, and you know, that could be, and, the, and Worthington has done one, but mm -hmm. all their board members signed that along with some of their leadership team. Mm -hmm. So there are all kinds of different ways to do it. Um, but, you know, the, I, and they're all strikingly similar because mm -hmm. there's language that gets, starts getting right. used. But then there are um, things that are different in each district too, and things that different districts may want to highlight or not. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. interesting. That would be my addition to the thinking on that. I mean, it might be worth um, just putting it to all of the districts that you know, it it doesn't just impact one of us, it impacts all of us. Uh, was, yeah. And you know, we talked about, you know, what's the logical next step when we take this step, you know, mm -hmm. the the long, the long term. What's the actual action as opposed to right. passing? Exactly. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Ms. Pickrell. Yes, Victoria uh, covered the policy committee. And again, we have another meeting tomorrow. Hopefully we can get to some of those policies that Jonathan mentioned in his report. Um, we also had another um, Parks and Recs meeting um, of the board. The, most of the conversation dealt with maintenance around uh, Jeffrey Mansion, the complex around Jeffrey Mansion, but there is still summer employment opportunities for uh, if we have students in the district who qualify, um, please look out on Facebook in different ways they're trying to advertise for summer positions through the rec department. Um, we also have now a full board. We have uh, two new members of the board, Ali D'Angelo and Tim Buzbachenko are, have joined as new members. So uh, that's very exciting as well. Awesome. Any questions for Ms. Pickerel? Thank you, Mr. Hall. Um, so <clears throat> last month, I briefly mentioned that we were in the process or student council was in the process of uh, selecting a new uh, executive board for next year. And I'm happy to say that we've made selections. So the communications chair for next year will be Samara Khan. The events chair will be Alyssa Shishkova. And the policy chair will be Annabelle Long. Um, we had a lot of applicants, a lot more than we anticipated. So it was uh, it was difficult to make some selections, but I'm very confident in all three of the people that we selected. Um, next Monday, we will have, I think our final, at least my final student council meeting. And it'll be as a, I guess, transition of power slash passing of the reins to the uh, next executive board and president. Um, and I also wanted to mention prom. I know it's not a student council event, but I, I know that all the students are really appreciative of all the parents who put in a lot of work to make it a fun night for all of us. 
Um, and as this is my last meeting, I wanted to give some thanks. So I first want to thank the student body for giving me trust and allowing me to have this position um, and being and allowing me to be a representative for them. And I also want to thank all of you guys. Um, I know that you guys aren't required to have a student voice on the board, but I'm very, very appreciative that you've allowed me to speak here and uh, express the opinions of the student body. Um, this has been a really great experience for me, and I feel like I've learned a lot, and I know that I'll take the lessons I've learned here uh, wherever I go in life. So thank you guys. That's awesome. Thank you, Quinn. I just will add that Dr. Fine and I were at a presentation today from a number of schools, and one of the schools was presenting on how they would like to have a student voice on their board. And so I felt great that we had that all the time. I hadn't, I hadn't thought about not having it. So I'm, I'm really grateful that we do, and I'm grateful for your work. Thank you. Okay, uh, turn it over to Dr. Fine. So yes, thank you. I wanna start with uh, recognition of Quinn Hall. I appreciate all you've done. This is my first experience on the board. I found out my daughter actually sent me a, a picture a year ago about right now is when I learned I got to go on this journey. And little did I know I'd be able to go on the journey with you. I think you've done a fantastic job and I love that you just added that piece of trust that you had the trust within the student body and the voice of the student body. It says a lot about who you are and also about our student body to be able to, to come to you and share some of the things. And I think the most powerful moment that I had with you was in that first meeting where you shared the voice of the students. Uh, and I learned a valuable lesson that student voice should be at the start of our meeting and not at the end of our meeting. So we are really grateful. I'm really proud of the work that you've done. I'm excited to see where the journey takes you. Tell us uh, what's ahead for you next year. So I'm going to uh, Dartmouth College, which is in New Hampshire, and I'm planning, I mean, it might, I might change, but my plan right now is to major in, oh, yeah, switch. Uh, my plan right now is to major in government with a focus in international relations and also major in Middle Eastern studies. Well, we're excited to see where it takes you. We, it's not enough, but we've got a little uh, gift package in here for you. Uh, we're going to start a new tradition where our student representative is going to have a paper. Uh, in our uh, walkway with your information on it. Also, uh, you've probably seen us going around and we go around and we identify champions in our district. And we can't think of a better champion than you who have given selfless hours to uh, others. And uh, we've identified you as a champion. So I think you know that the Vex coin, see how the Vex coin works? Want to tell us how the Vex coin works? So I think actually I'm not. I think you give it to someone else that you think is like represents that. Exactly right. So if you've earned it, you can keep it. You can probably print it. Or when you see other classmates or educators, staff members, anyone within our district doing things in kind, being champion for others, right? So give it up for Quinn Hall for being a major. Work. And Quinn, I would like to say, I know um, you you came onto the board at a time when we probably had some epically long meetings. <laughs> um, and it is no small feat being a senior trying to figure out where you want to go to college and take all your exams. Uh, and you have always just done a really great job and, and kept a great sense of humor um, during our long um, meeting. So best of luck to you. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> Swallowed wrong. <laughs> so thank you, Quinn. A couple of other things, and I know there's a lot on our agenda tonight, so I'll, I'll try to be brief. Uh, May celebrations, we've got lots going on. Uh, Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. It's also Jewish American Heritage Month. Marcel's practiced and always does a fantastic job working with our students and staff to make sure that they have resources uh, to, support, to support conversations that are taking place. Uh, in these arenas. It's also today is National uh, School Nurses Day, and I can't think of a better way than uh, as we've been through the journey. I'm so thankful for the nurses that we have in this district. Uh, they've been through a lot. They continue to go through a lot, and they continue to show up with a smile, a calm demeanor, and take care of our, our students and staff at, at their greatest need. So we are so thankful for our, our nurses. Also, our entire staff, it was Staff and Teacher Appreciation Month last week or week last week, and we were able to celebrate our staff uh, throughout the week with the help of Johnson's ice cream truck. 
other incredible things done by our PTO. So we are just so thankful and, and grateful for the, the work of, of our uh, all of our staff members. There's a lot that's going on in May. We've had incredible music concerts, art, uh, athletics. We've had uh, art shows coming up and we've had a lot of activity where our students get to showcase the amazing things that they do. And I'm just so proud of our students and our staff for being able to provide those types of opportunities. We've had Earth Day events uh, and uh, walking to school events. We've had national uh, signing letter of intent for our athletes. Our artists are coming up, I believe next week. Uh, also today, Victoria talked about it. We were able to attend the OSU Student Leadership Collaborative with Steve Shapiro, where we took, I believe nine students were able to showcase uh, the action research that they've been participating and have plans to share that action research with the board and administration so that they can make a difference in the things that they're seeing. Also, congratulations to Bexley High School staff and students for being recognized by the US News and World Report as a type top high school in the region and state. We recognize that a world-class Bexley education is measured in countless ways that are not always captured in rankings like this. However, we are honored to celebrate this accomplishment and take great pride in the experiences that we provide our students and staff every day. More exciting news, we are in our 100th year, as you know, at Montrose, but it's also, I've learned, it's our 100th graduating class. So Quinn, that's a big deal. You get to participate in some excitement. To honor the 100th graduating class, the class of 2022, Kyle Peterson, one of Bexley's outstanding graduates, will give our keynote address at 10 a.m. at Bexley High School Stadium uh, here at the end of May. Peterson is a 1983 alum and is the former executive director of the Walton Family Foundation, which donated $2.3 billion to children's education and environmental initiatives between 2014 and 2018. This is obviously an exciting time for our district and our community. The legacy of Bexley City Schools is extraordinary and I'm proud to serve in a community that puts such an emphasis on education and the care of our students. We're excited to celebrate Quinn and his classmates coming up. Athletic facilities update, not a ton to update. You've heard this over the last probably nine months. Last week we did meet with the uh, JCC officials as well as architects from MKSK. And that was to review a conceptual design for the proposed athletic facilities that are taking place on the property of the JCC. The team will continue to tweak and adjust the proposed designs to meet the needs of the JCC and Bexley City Schools. We appreciate our partnership with the JCC and I look forward to future updates. Hopefully soon we can get you what some of those designs look like as we start to finalize some of those uh, early conversations. Happy to pause and take any questions before I get into some staffing updates. Volleyball, exciting. I'm a little biased here. I've got a daughter on the team, so it's even more exciting as we get to see uh, some exciting uh, coaches joining the ranks. Uh, I'm excited to recommend Katie Curtis for the girls varsity volleyball head coach position. Coach Curtis has 35 years of volleyball experience, both playing and coaching. Coach Curtis was a four-year letter winner as a player at Otterbein University. And after college, Coach Curtis began her coaching career and has coached club volleyball in Wilmington, Delaware, Charlotte, North Carolina, and Fort Wayne, Indiana, before moving back to Columbus. She's currently coaching club volleyball with the Greater Columbus Volleyball Club. And along with club coaching, Coach Curtis has served as a volunteer coach with Bexley Middle School and High School over the past three seasons. While not on a volleyball court, she is the senior manager of platform services for Denali, a WNS company. We are incredibly excited for the future of Bexley Volleyball. And I know Dr. Baker also has a daughter, so uh, we're excited for what's ahead. Any questions on uh, coach? <clears throat> Chief academic officer. So looking at our organizational chart, um, as I've discussed with each of you, on a couple of occasions. I plan on moving forward with posting the position for a chief academic officer. This will be to fill the vacant deputy superintendent position. So we will uh, post for a chief academic officer to replace the vacant deputy superintendency. We have plans of embarking as uh, Dr. Jade mentioned earlier on a strategic planning process, which will take place next year. And in my opinion, it makes sense for that process to drive any larger changes to our organization. Additionally, we have looked at other districts and our administrative supports are comparable to other like districts. 
Additionally, this position has been factored into the five-year forecast, which Kyle is going to share some exciting stuff for us a little bit later this evening. And it will ensure that we maximize the focus support to our staff and students to close the gap of lost learning to a myriad of barriers students have experienced post-pandemic, which is why I feel this position is essential. As a result, I have updated our Chief Academic Officer job description to assist us in finding a qualified individual to provide focused leadership for the district's academic initiatives in conjunction with the rest of our team. You will also see on the agenda an updated organizational chart with the title change from Deputy Superintendent to Chief Academic Officer. And lastly, Kyle has assisted us in updating the 22-23 administrative salary range to reflect this change. So I'm happy to pause for any questions or discussion. Uh, Dr. Feingold, the um, <clears throat> change in title and everything also include change in job description. Yes. So in your on your agenda, you'll see the updated job description uh, to meet the needs of that new position. Gotcha. Just I just wanted to yeah. clarify. Yep. Jason, we've had a chance to look at the job description, so I appreciate that you have shifted it. Um, away from the deputy superintendent and made it focus more specifically on the pillars that include not just academics, but social, emotional well being, restorative practices, yeah. equity, and wellness, all the things yeah. that precede academic excellence. Love that. Thank you. Thank you. And my last, second to last update, which is really exciting. Rachel, you want to head to the podium? We're going to put you on the hot seat. This is, this is where it gets exciting. This is why we do it. It is with great pleasure that I share with you that Mrs. Rachel Nicewander has accepted the position of Maryland Elementary Principal pending the approval of the board this evening. She will be starting her 20th year uh, in Bexley City Schools, and we could not be more thrilled that you are going to be the principal at Maryland. Many in our community are already familiar with uh, your resume of experiences in the classroom and instructional leadership and current principalship of the district's online school. Rachel is an experienced, thoughtful, and inclusive educator, communicator, and leader. And I know people are really excited because my inbox has not stopped. People are really excited about you joining in that role. It was no surprise that Mrs. Nicewander stood out among the 39 highly qualified applicants. Over 60 Maryland staff, community members, and students volunteered throughout the multi-layered interview process that revealed Mrs. Nicewander was the best candidate for this role. The process included community and staff input, several resume reviews with committees, and seven formal interview rounds. We are grateful to each individual who participated in the search and interview process, and we look forward to the leadership, Mrs. Nicewander, that you will bring to the new school year. Rachel is here this evening, which is awesome. Is there anything you'd like to say or add? I do. I, I appreciate um, Melissa kind of guiding the, the ship for everybody and communicating with 60 different people, uh, the process for finding the right person to lead Maryland. And, and you just can tell how important this is. Um, so I appreciate that I was able to continue through that process and that I'm sitting here today that um, I have the support of Dr. Fine. So I appreciate that very much. We had a great conversation. I'm excited about Maryland's future. I love being a part of that school. Um, I love being a part of this community. I, it's It really is a little bit of a, not only a goal that I'm achieving, but a, a dream to be able to become the principal at Maryland. So um, I appreciate the opportunity very much. Well, congratulations. Thank you. That's really exciting. And uh, I'm envious of you and your position as you start off something new in a new build, in, in a building that you are familiar with. Uh, and the students are very lucky. So thank you. I think you should announce this every week because much as your inbox, I've really enjoyed <laughs> my text messages and emails. So it's been good. I will tell you, Ms. Nicewander, I have um, seen your smiling face at board meetings for many, many years. Um, and I, I would often light up when you would get up to present because you can see the love that you had for the work that you were doing, the school. Um, and I think Maryland is gonna be a really blessed little town over there to have uh, you there. Um, when I saw that picture, I'm like, that yep. embodies you um, fully every day, all the time. Uh, so I'm, when I got that call that that was happening, I literally squealed. So um, thank you for it. We're super excited for you. Thank you, Rachel. And I do, I love that uh, photograph. I think it says 
a lot and shows the future of, of Maryland. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Appreciate it. And my last item, I want to talk calendars, not as exciting as a new principal. <laughs> but you will see on the board agenda the 22-23 uh, calendar and the 23-24 school calendars. As you know, the board already approved the 22-23 calendar earlier this school year, but it has been re-added to this agenda because I am recommending we add an additional professional development day for staff in order to support our ever-growing needs of legislative mandates and policies. You can see that we have added the second administrative or second ad additional professional development day for staff on Friday, September 16th. This would become a staff only day and students would have no school on this day. You will also see on the 23-24 calendar being proposed as a first reading. So this is the first time you've seen it. It also has an additional professional development day built into the calendar. I'm recommending a second PD day to be added for staff on Monday, November 6th to support these ever growing needs that we talked about of the mandates as well as individual growth of our staff. This would again become a staff only day and students would have no school. Please note that we far exceed our student hours required by the state, which allows us to create this valuable time for staff. Um, Dr. Fine, will we require an MOU for these additional PD days or these are still within the- Still within. Okay. And, I, and uh, BEA has been in conversations with us okay. throughout. Yep. Jason, I appreciate your prioritizing teacher professional development as that is the, since teachers are the, greatest indicator of student success. Yeah, thank you. And that's all I have. Thank great, you. Great report. Thank you so much. All such important things. And it's really helpful as we move through the rest of our agenda. So we have a bunch of items listed um, for approval on this um, part of our agenda for all the way down through you. I'd like to pull out um, the, um, there's one policy that I'm gonna pull out at, in our second reading. Um, so I'd like to take, and, and, and if there's anything else that people, I'm, I'm gonna pull out S for S. And if there's anything else that board members wanna pull out and discuss separately, before we entertain a, a motion. I'd like to pull out, I, I don't know what letter it is, the gifted one? Yeah, that's, that's. I just said the poly, you know, so that's one of the, I'm gonna pull but out S, which is the- The S is the handbooks. Oh, I'm sorry. You're um, wanting- It's the board policies T. Yeah, I'll pull that one out and then we'll vote on that minus the one that you- Thank you. Yep. Are you pulling S into it? Just, just T. T, I'm sorry, I looked at the wrong one. <clears throat> so- <laughs> um, so those are second reads and, and we can do um, that one separately. Anything else that anybody wants to pull out of that for B through U except T? And I have a motion to approve for B through S and for U. So moved. Thank you. And a second. Second. Thank you. All, all in favor of approval of those items for B through S and for you, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. That motion carries. And then let's go to 4T. Um, we're going to pull out IGBB. So can I have a motion to approve all of the policies that are listed there, except for IGBB. IGBB is the policy um, that's headed programs for students who are identified as gifted. We had a first read on that last month. We talked about some language. The language on that one has been updated, but we can talk about that separately. These other ones are all things we had a first read last month. Can I have a motion to approve um, everything that's in 4T other than IGBB? So moved. Thank you, and a second? A second. Thank you. All in favor of that motion, please signify by saying aye. 
Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you, that motion carries. So that leaves us with IGBB. Um, I'll take a motion and then we can have discussion. Is there a motion to approve IGBB? So moved. And a second? Second. Thank you. Any comments or discussion? Yeah. Um, I, I wanna appreciate the, the time and effort that the policy committee has invested in the revision of that. Um, and I realize we are moving more towards um, a more inclusive policy and in thinking about how we value all students. I think we still have a ways to go. I would offer that the gifted policy as written is sort of in many ways diametrically opposed to our equity policy and also our values around belongingness. And I think student uh, sentences such as the one that students who perform at remarkably high levels of accomplishment when compared to other students of the same age, experience and environment are identified as gifted under state law make me cringe. Um, because they, that sentences like that are an example of sort of colorblind or race or gender or socioeconomic or language neutral language that maintain systems that continue to produce inequitable results, right? Like, so we can say that, but what we know to be true is that unless something has changed dramatically, the demographics of our students and gifted don't represent the demographics of our students, right? So what it means is that those students don't share the same experience and environment, right? And students who are identified as gifted tend to be white, tend to be from higher socioeconomic status, tend to be from two highly educated family, two uh, families with two highly educated parents. So there's access and opportunity component to being identified to, as gifted, not merely innate ability. So as a result, we continue to position those students with the most advantages to also receive the most coveted services and the most coveted educators. So the process itself is inherently flawed because it continues to produce inequitable results. Um, so it's an equity issue. So whether it's this is state law or state language, it still is to me incredibly problematic. Um, Victoria, can we clarify if this language is, first of all, if it's state language and are we required if this is basically policy aligned to state? Yeah, law? so this is state, this is comes out of the law. And um, as we discussed last month, um, we called down our, our, our uh, leader of gifted um, education uh, sat in on the meetings that we've had about this. And we talked to, she talked to um, the folks that we have to report to annually about what we're doing. And um, there is, um, concern about taking out language that is in the state statute um, in terms of getting our, uh, you know, we are, this is, this is law. I, no, I understand that. I, I, but I also understand where Dr. Jade has gone in terms of language is, is important yeah. and we can't have one policy out there that's saying, hey, um, this is who we are, this is what we do. And then another policy that is sitting out there basically saying the opposite. So my question is, if we were to strike the language who perform at remarkably high levels of accomplishment, because then that right there in and of itself could lead to lots of other ways to determine that. Um, when compared to, can we just strike the language and have it um, just, just pick up where it says students who are identified as gifted under state law. Like, do we need to have all of that, you know? Um, I think that- you We're know, not breaking a law by striking that language, are we? No, I, I think the answer to that is no. I, I don't know the answer to whether um, Dr. Jade would then be in favor of this policy. I, I, oh. I appreciate uh, Alicia's point. I think mine is also has to do with, so the language that I found, um, I found that problematic, but also that there's an assumption that experience environment are identical and they're not, mm -hmm. right? So these, the way kids are identified, it's privileged by the way, the things that we value. So we identify kids that 
bring a certain fund of knowledge, bring a certain way of being in the world, have certain lived experiences. And that's in many ways how they get identified as gifted, right? So there's some kids who are identified, but the number of kids who are identified as gifted is disproportionate to the very few who are not just privileged by their environment. And we are working hard in our district to, to improve that. And you know the reality is that we, are, we have introduced um, efforts this year, uh, you know, in January or so, and there's been a lot of work to, you know, move to different tools, you know, all the tools that we use to identify students who are gifted are required, you know, there's a, there are several of them, and we are required to use them. We can select from the, you know, cafeteria of options, and we have done work in our district to make sure that we are um, using, and we've selected a new tool so that we um, will cast a wider net and bridge equity gaps in that's, that's been the effort. Um, I, I, and we are doing other things as you guys know, cause it's been discussed, you know, in our board meetings this calendar year to try to make sure that we are being as you know, inclusive as we can. Um, I think the only reason why I, I, I'm pushing um, alongside what Dr. Jadis is saying is simply because words are very important and yeah. powerful. And when there are policy, there are voice. Right. And if it's going to represent what we value as a district, it should be aligned to what we're saying in all of our policies. Um, and so I just want to scan before I throw that out there really quickly. Um, if this references our equity policy at the end. So Alicia, are you offering that just to take students who perform or students who are identified as gifted under state law and taking out the whole sentence? Just take the sentence out and just put who are, um, wait, let me go back to it. Sorry, I was on the wrong page. Students who are identified as gifted and take out the whole sentence. Yeah, just take that problematic sentence out because we, we know we have to identify students. We know that there are criteria that we, you know, that they have decided makes the determination and we are following those steps, but we're not calling out these because what those words are essentially dog whistle words. It, it, and, and so it, it does under, it does uh, support a system. It's, it's, it does support a system. Um, and so I think if we're gonna, if we're gonna mean what we say and do what we say, we just strike the language. Well, I, I'm, as long I'm as we're compliant with law, that, um, if you know, I think we've got a motion on the language as it is. Um, I'm just going to remind everybody that we can take language out, but we're still going to do this. Right. So it's just, it's just a um, right. We still have to comply with what the, the state law requires that we do and that we document it. But either we reword the language or we just strike, if it, it, it's, it's dressing, it's whistle words. I mean, it, it could come out. If it's not required by law that it be in there and no one has said and been able to corroborate that that's the case, we might as well- It's not required, it's yeah. gonna make the job more challenging. So that's what I'm trying to understand. Dr. Fine is removing the language. What is the impact to how we go about doing, or if we're already doing this, then it shouldn't be that big a deal to strike it. What, what makes it more difficult? What they've told um, our staff is that when you send your plan back and it's missing language, they may or may not do a timely review for you. Well, shouldn't we, shouldn't we send when we send our language or our, our plan, send with it our, because this policy yeah, should reference our equity policy and we should send a statement why we believe that this is valuable and why we believe that this isn't. And, and we can simply say, we believe that this language does not represent who we are and our values as Bexley. Here's what we do. We're compliant with law. Here you go. And I mean, it's, it's worth to engage the conversation and they can come back and tell us all the reasons why they think it's you know, not going to work, but I mean, is it really hurting anything to remove that type of language that reinforces that system? So is the proposal to have this language read 
students of the district in grades kindergarten through 12 can be identified as exhibiting and then having those in there? As identified as gifted under state law. Well, I'm asking about the A, B, C, D. This, this is informational for people. What, what those it. definitions are, you're saying. Like, it's just giving it sort of a... It tells you what are the areas in which students can be identified as gifted. Well, but superior i'm just asking what the proposal is just strike in the language in the in the top yeah in the in the top sentence because we can't we can't change the fact that the state these are the areas that the state measures right what i'm saying i think what sorry what victoria is saying is we still need the qualification of grades mm -hmm. k-12 mm -hmm. right k-12 so i'm just so, saying so who came up with the language from is that language that you were given, or is that language that you wrote? This language that we were. Given. I think we were given this, this, this is, language. This language has been in our policy for you know years. Right, but given it's by from the state, but from the state. Mm -hmm. So the whole thing is from the state. But so is it if we took out, no, I'm with you. Is it recommended is language? State. That's what I'm trying to understand. So if we took out, is this sentence number one? Is that sentence from students of the district down to state law? Was that given by the state, or is that something we wrote? It's this section that you're talking about is in the state language. Okay. So what Alicia's offering, I think, is that we, part of what we're doing, I mean, it's much like the resolution, right? We're saying, here's who we are. Here's some of the things that we value. We value that kids get the education that they need. So we understand some of this. But here's some things that are also important to us, right? So I think... What I'm asking is if we, if is the proposal on the table, I think I understand why, the why. I'm now just getting down oh. to the nitty gritty. Students of the district in get grades kindergarten through 12 can be identified as gifted, as exhibiting, and then have A through D. I, I think, think it wouldn't be, I don't think it can be. I think it's a student, I think you could, students who are, you go to the K to the 12 and then you say are identified as gifted right. by state law. state law period and then according to now i'm okay yeah so and, and here's where i would make the recommendation is we can continue to flesh out all the ways that maybe this policy can be expanded beefed up improved to continue to align with equity, but if the first line of the, the policy can be corrected with a simple strike of recommended language, your recommended is not law, it's, it's just guidance, and we can provide our reason why we struck the language. And we can even say, hey, take it from us, maybe you should think about a revision. <laughs> just, you know, just a thought. That might not earn us points, but, you know. The only, if you pull it out as I just heard, the students of the district in grades K-12 are identified as gifted under state law. That's saying all K-12 students. No, I think what it's saying is that we apply state law to identify them as Perfect. gifted. So we just need the wordsmith it correctly. You know, the, it used to say the district ident identifies students you know, it used to be written identified, in right? And we changed it to try to, you know, fix the gifted language. Um, but I think that it can be read. Um, Is there a timeline for this? We have to have an end. No, but I think that it's, um, you know, I think it's time to go forward with this. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to entertain a, a motion to accept this. Do we need this? Do we need the paragraph? Could we just say the district follows identification and eligibility criteria for grades kindergarten through 12 as specified in state law? Here are the according the, to the, the I, student can be identified by exhibiting. Right. We could take out the just take out the whole sentence because the sentence is just dressing. It doesn't add anything, but it, it definitely is counterproductive to what we want to accomplish. Just a thought. Yeah, okay. I, I'm not sure I think it's counterproductive, but I hear your concerns about it. I, you know, um, so the the new thought is the so district counterproductive follows. It's probably harsh. It's just, it's not fully aligned. 
the district follows the identification eligibility criteria specified in state law period accordingly a student let's just say a student can be identified as exhibiting and then a through d mm -hmm. in grades kindergarten through 12. okay I think that's okay. I'm going to suggest that we take that as a second read and vote on it. And if we determine that it's a problem, we'll come back. Is that all right? I'd like to entertain a motion for approval of IGBB with that change. So moved. And a second. Second. Thank you. All in favor. Is there any further discussion? All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that motion carries. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't say aye. I was looking for something. <laughs> I, I guess I have a comment, not about, so we had the policy in place. Now, the fun part of looking into talking with the, our gifted uh, staff about the process of widening the pipeline. I think that's gonna be a richer conversation. Yeah, I mean, they've already had that. They've started that conversation in yeah. earnest and have put in place steps to do that. Um, the hire of that new role. Yeah, and yeah. hire that new role and changing the, the um, you know, the tools language, or right. whatever that they use to identify. It's not gonna happen overnight, right. but I'm optimistic that work is being done right. uh, to move in that direction. Um, Okay, we are through to section five, treasurer's report. Thank you. I think before I'll get into the five-year forecast presentation, I know you just voted, voted on it um, uh, for a first reading. Were there any questions about the cash balance policy? I may reference that a little bit later, but... Uh, Okay, so um, five-year forecast month, we have two of these a year. This is what some of us will call an update uh, because we've got better information um, on the current fiscal year um, compared to November. Um, just as a, a quick overview, this let me back up and say, if you have questions at any time, interrupt me, that's, that's fine. Um, but, Forecasts are just a, a reflection of district values of previous and current strategic plans over the years, not just the most recent, but previous strategic plans um, with limited knowledge on the future. I, I don't have a crystal ball. I wish I did. Um, what's great about the, the May update is it is budget season, so I have a better idea of what next year is going to look like. We have a better idea of staffing needs, student need student needs, which in turn turn into um, staffing needs um, for, for future years. Um, do I need to point? I need to hit the right button. Just don't turn it off. <laughs> right. Um, that's why I'm look, that's why I'm using paper. Um, so new known since November. Um, we finalized and know our final numbers with property and income taxes. We'll take a look at those. And what I've been um, pushing or what maybe waiting on from the state is our state funding. Uh, so we have a better idea of what that's gonna look like. And we'll look at that. The unknowns, not much new. Um, COVID impacts on student learning, we're still getting a handle of that and, and adjusting and um, just working with um, administrators, teachers on, on that, um, which does have budgetary budgetary impacts, inflation, um, which has been the big word in the economy the last um, couple of months. I'm not gonna say it again, but it is it is a concern for, for us, delays as well um, for deliveries. And then what's a broken record is uh, not much new on the unknowns is state funding and the income tax. We'll talk, like I said, we'll talk about those more. Um, so the revenue updates since November, property tax estimates are up by 116,000. Income taxes are up by almost 290,000. When you look at that on a graph, um, so this is um, in the blue compared to last fiscal year, red is the FY22 forecast from November. 
and then the green is our actual. So really not much different overall, even even though $400,000 may be a lot to individuals on a district wide basis, when you kind of throw that on a graph, not much different, but it is better. So that's always good. Um, the income tax, uh, we just received our July 30th payment, which is quarterly and is our last one on the year. So when you're looking at several years um, of history, um, some things I'd like to point out, the green arrow on the graph, consistently in, consistent increases, some rather large increases on the employer withholding, which is uh, the, the largest bucket, if you will. Um, and also the probably the more stable. These are payroll taxes essentially withheld from payrolls. Uh, the red arrow is estimated quarterly. So these are individuals who file with the state on a quarterly basis um, based on estimated income. Uh, and then the blue is the annual filing, which is usually the, the April deadline. And that largest chunk comes to us in July. In the yellow, uh, arrow are refunds. So just like some of us may receive refunds from uh, the federal or state government, um, school districts um, can also have refunds processed. So what um, this year's refunds were a little bit higher than the last two, but not as large as FY 18 or 19. So what I what I'm arrowing out is the fluctuations in the red the red sections. Um, dating back to FY17, you can see um, a rather large collection in estimations, then it dips down, dips down, then rebounds, dips down in FY21, and then um, does fairly well in FY22. This is, um, when you look at other districts, this is a fairly, uh, this is a fluctuation that other districts don't see so much. I think it's a representation of um, our community and our demographics financially. Uh, so it is something to kind of keep an eye out on um, every year. Obviously, can't forecast it, um, but just something that we've got to live with with our revenue. Mr. Smith, I'm curious, um, how does, um, you know, like work from home folks who, who now have to file taxes from wherever they're, um, they're reporting from home instead of you great, know. great question. So this is a residential tax based on where you put your head down at night, not gotcha, where you not work. Income. Correct. So individuals who work um, for the schools, for the city, for capital, if they do not live in Bexley, it's not, there's nothing withheld. It's, it's a bed tax is almost is, is a way to look at it is where your residence is. So your residence, um, you may have a residence in Bexley, but if you do not live in Bexley, you would not pay it. Gotcha. So the employer withholdings, when they are, they're within the bounds of the Bexley area. Uh, they right? would be, um, they but, would be employers that have the ability to withhold the school district income tax. So okay. nationwide is a rather large employer. I, I don't know if they have payroll capabilities. They probably do, but they would have capabilities of withholding okay. that. So yeah. us as an employer... Uh, we withhold residential taxes, school district income taxes. So Reynoldsburg um, has an income tax for their school district. We withhold that and send that to the state. Um, gotcha. Yeah. Okay, cool. So municip municipal is different. Municipal is primarily based on um, where you work. Right. Which to your question, um, that is changing um, effective this year to, to um, include for employers to track where their employees are, are physically working. Right, so that's where I was curious, would that have an impact for us um, employer withholdings? But you're saying not as no. a school district, not no. As a school district. Um, luckily, all of our employees work within and, and report to the city of Bexley. Mm -hmm. So we also remit um, municipal income taxes mm -hmm. as employees that work within. Darn. <laughs> but no, luckily that it, it, like I say, it's, it's kind of a bed tax mm -hmm. in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where you, where you reside. Right. State formula funding. This has been real fun. The last um, 14 months for school treasurers. Uh, so the state um, 
has had an overhaul of, of funding for education, which you've heard me kind of punt for several months until we get some final reports. And there's still some outstanding, but we have a clear picture of it. Um, so it's, it's more direct funding to schools for students, not entirely, but more direct. Um, scholarship students are no longer, um, it, the money does not necessarily follow students for um, scholarship uh, reasons. Um, so it's, there's now a base cost meth, methol, methodol, I can't, method, let's just say method, um, <laughs> for um, coming up with a cost per student. It's unique to each school district. For us, that comes down to about $7,200, saying that's, that's our base cost for a student. Many factors are into that. I won't go into it, but the, the key number is 7,200. Then there's something called a local um, capacity in this third line. Factors that impact that are student population and demographics, socioeconomic demographics mainly. Um, English language learners are another one, for example. Property valuation, which is nothing new. Um, then in red, personal income and district um, and district resident of district residents income. So this is new. Um, and then also historical funding and caps and guarantees. So um, prior to this funding formula, like I said, income um, was not really a factor in funding. But because of this new model and because of the demographics of Bexley, um, it makes us look wealthier than what we were when you look at the two funding formulas because of this red line factor. So our local capacity, um, I, I said the, the base cost was 7,200. Our local capacity or what the state says we're responsible for or should come up with is uh, 6,600. So there is a gap of $600, which is what basically what we're getting from the state. So that's the gap. Um, and then that'll, that updates every year. So this is one of the reports that we get from the state, um, this finance payment report system. You can find this on ODE's website. We get it every two weeks. It changes every two weeks, sometimes by pennies, sometimes by big dollar amounts, depending on the, um, the timing. But in the blue is what our base state funding amount is. Um, what it would what it would have looked like last year under this formula. Last year, like I said earlier, students are directly funded to us. Last year, we would have been funded for students on an autism scholarship and then had the money taken away, deducted maybe is a better, nicer term, um, deducted from us. And we never saw the kid in our doors, but they were on our, our books essentially. So after that is taken away, they've come up with this blue arrow column. So trying to look at apples to apples. So they've come up with our base funding there in blue. In the yellow column, yellow arrowed line, if there were no, this is basically saying what they would fund us for um, under this new funding model, the 50, 60 different, um, metrics or calculations, we'd get 1.6 million compared to 3.9 last year. Um, but some districts are going to get more. Um, many, many districts are going to get more, probably 550 and 40 would not, and we're one of the 40. But it's also phased in. The state couldn't afford to fully fund the, the formula for everyone. So it's phased in over... Um, planned six years, but we're only on a biennium, so we're only gonna get phased in for two. Um, so our red arrow is a negative because the yellow is less than the blue. Other, like I said, other districts, their um, yellow is more than the blue. So they're gonna have a positive phase in. So this, luckily the state has, um, kind of guardrails, caps and guarantees saying you, 
you won't get less than what you got the year before. That's been the history for decades now in Ohio. So we're lucky that we won't have any state funding cuts. That's what those red um, donuts are saying we're, we're guaranteed or we're, we're getting additional funding of $375,000. So to, to be made whole back to the 3.9. Kyle, that says temporary. What Jay says temporary. Could you qualify? Yeah, that? Tem temporary um, is in state law. I, it, it's it could. It's not a time frame. Okay. No, um, the state would have the ability, or they'll have the discussion to continue that. Probably, if they would keep this funding formula, and there's discussions about that at the state level, whether that will happen or not. Um, but so, as long as the funding formula remains in place that temporary word kind of isn't temporary. Is that what we're saying? Correct, yeah. Okay. Yep. And we'll, we'll still, uh, sorry, and we'll still collect that 3.9. Yes, hmm. yeah. So because it's a phase in, we're phasing, if, if it would be fully implemented over six years, we'd be phased, that 375,000 will grow and grow, the difference between the 3.9 and the 1.6. So 2.6 on a guarantee, which is kind of scary because the state could come in and say, mm -hmm. we, we're not gonna guarantee that anymore. Um, they haven't said that before, but they could. So just to summarize, if the guarantee would go away, like you say, I'm not just the worst case scenario, yep. that would make a change you said over 2 million? Yeah, the difference between the blue and the yellow. Blue and yellow, okay. Once, once it's fully phased in. Okay. Yeah. So next year, that red donut is going to be um, close to a million dollars for FY23. Hmm. Feels like uh, a yo-yo. Right. <laughs> Something new this year is um, line C, special education. Um, there's something called catastrophic costs, uh, which is a reimbursement from the state, uh, which is a new deduction. They take 10% of that line off to the right, far right, 305,000. They take 10% of that as a deduction and hold it off in a bucket where the state, all state school districts apply for a reimbursement on catastrophic special education students um, that have uh, costs greater than 28,000 or 32,000, depending on um, the, the student's categorical um, amount or designation. So they so, reserve the dollars for you, but you still have to apply to get them. Correct. So for example, ours is 30,000. I applied for um, at max 163,000 is the max that we can receive because that's also subject to our, our formula or our state share. Mm. So my hope is we will gain money on this. Um, can, so having $30,000 taken back, I'd love for us to get that 163 um, right. as a gain, but I won't know until all of this, the state process all, processes all of the applications because it goes into a pool. It's, it's then equally, equally distributed based on state share um, and amounts applied for. How often do they not approve an application? Uh, they, they usually approve all the applications. Um, it's just the dollar amount that's unknown. Oh, okay. I mean, it, it, they're all reviewed. I've never um, had any issues with so ones we've- You apply we've... for 163, but maybe you get 160. Yeah. Okay. And so that's- um, Yeah, it's, it's a difficult application process, but it's something that all schools are really diving into now because of this 10% withholding automatic. Mm -hmm. The state had a, a pool that wasn't part of the formula and a lot of districts really didn't apply for it in the past okay. because they, didn't, they really didn't quote unquote lose money, mm -hmm. um, but now the state's reserving it. Hmm. We're hopeful that the um, the percentage of reimbursement is higher this year. 
because of this withholding amount. So I, I think the key takeaway is um, this red donut is the state is guaranteeing us $375,000 um, and it's back to that red line, which, which has impacted us. We weren't, we've been a guarantee district for many years. Um, for a couple of years due to enrollment growth, we were a cap district, meaning the, the state didn't give us everything um, based on the formula, which actually has helped us in this transition between state funding formulas. We got enrollment growth two years ago, which has helped in the blue column. Yeah, because we won't get less. We're guaranteed yeah. not to get less than what we. Yeah, we would have been guaranteed less had we not had, had that enrollment that growth. Mm -hmm. Does that so, enrollment growth opportunity continue? It, um, no, but it's you'll see that in line L formula transition. You'll uh, that's part of that guarantee. So we kind of have two guarantees going on. The big one is the red donut. Line L is the second one. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. It's it's been a lot of changes, but I I think for education, it's good to have a funding formula um, because you can kind of see how you're getting funded um, and in what areas. But it's difficult for a district like us to to not get much support from the state because of how they they view us. Um, but we're fortunate here on a local level that we have great resources. On the expenditure side, um, just some small changes um, to reflect current expenditure trends. If you recall on the monthly reports, um, personnel and payroll have been under budget, benefits have been higher than budget, and so have purchased services. Um, mainly purchase service increases are due to transportation costs and staffing. Um, we do have some staffing on a purchase service line. Um, updated staffing numbers for next year, an increase of one, one full-time equivalent or FTE is planned. Um, we do have some other new hires next year, but we will use the ESSER or COVID dollars um, for, for a few positions. And um, as of right now in the forecast, those positions are planned to come on to general fund once those dollars expire. That's what I was asking to ask. Huge challenge, I think, when we're, we're we are making decisions with temporary funds that are going to have long term consequences. Cool. Um, was, so if we're putting FTEs in and we've already done one and we're put that it's paid with ESSER dollars, and as a general policy, positions don't leave. Right? It's not like we have it and then it's going to go away. I think we could, you know, the, the the gifted position was a position that was part time, part time, part time, going to be full time for a year. Then we still have it. Right, the assistant principal at the middle school. I mean, I think so. We have positions that came out of when we add a position, we don't necessarily ever take it away, but we are adding positions paid out of COVID dollars that aren't going to exist that are then going to become general fund positions. And I think that's a big challenge that we're going to face. But that's how we, we when we look out the five-year forecast, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't want to speak for the treasurer, but when we're looking out on a five-year forecast, for example, we, we look to see when does that need to hit our, our budget. Like we could right, fund it now. Numbers. Yeah, but we could fund it now through the, through the budget, but we don't have to fund it through the budget. So it's sort of like we're saving it until we have to. We could fund it, but why, why spend it when we have those dollars to spend? Am I incorrect? It, it, yeah, so an example um, is, I'm trying to think of which one to use. We fund the- we, we have the ability to use ESSER dollars on positions that we probably would use on general fund or with general fund had COVID dollars not been there. So- the COVID dollars are available. We're essentially putting money in the bank with general fund while we spend federal dollars. I, but your concern is is totally valid. Right. Yes. So when we get two years, I mean, 
are we saying that we've got so much deep pockets that when the SR funds, we're just going to have all the money we need? No, Dr. Fine, Dr. Fine and I have, I, I tell him every time that we talk about new positions that are going on this, like, okay, is, is eventually it- Eventually we're going to have to pay those. Eventually we're going to have to pay those or have a discussion. Do we- do we backfill those through with attrition over the next two years? Is it, right. um, how do we evaluate the program that ESSER is paying for? So as an example, we've hired a fourth guidance counselor at the high school that is being paid with these dollars, um, was our first person with these dollars this school year. Um, so when the funds dry up, is, is that, we'll have to evaluate, was this fourth um, counselor, um, was it a, is having for is that what gonna, we want. What, what impact are we getting for Because that's going to be same for the talent development specialist and all the other fun. Correct. Yes. So, so we've. But we have we historically measured impact. So we've added positions, say the principal position, pay the gifted position, not the gifted full time gifted when Quint was there and that, you know, when they made that position. So have we done that previously? Have we said, oh, yeah, this was we really needed this and here's the impact that that's had, or have we just kept the position? Oh, no, no, we absolutely assessed whether or not the success of whether it was a demand for because we had more need and we needed to follow it. And we recognized like, hey, this position can't really do what we needed to do in a part time role. And so it makes sense to go full time. And here are all the think ways that we can expand and, and, and broaden it. But yeah, I, I mean, we when it's brought to us, we 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 are absolutely assessing whether or not this this works. We're right, so you're discussing it on the front end. I'm, I've not seen anything that says, yes, here's the positive impact that these positions have had. That's we get I'm those saying. reports in board meetings all the time. I want to make another um, analogy. When I started on the board, and Kyle, you can correct me on this, my memory is that we were receiving about $89,000 annually from, we used to say, you know, from the governor, but the state was providing us wellness dollars that were specifically earmarked for wellness work and we spent them, but we never knew if they were going to be there again. You know, it was just a annually or on the biennial biennial budget, mm -hmm. we would get these these dollars. And I asked this sort of similar question. It's like, okay, what happens when these monies aren't there anymore? But we did want to bring the monies in and spend them the way we were spending them. You wouldn't want to not use them. But then we have had to make decisions about, you know, it's the same question. What do you do when the money's not there anymore? I think whoever said it, I, I do tend to look at this as these ESSER dollars are available for us, they're available for certain uses. We, for example, last year did all that summer school work and we increased the pay and we, you know, increased the offerings for the joyful summer that we wanted to provide to our students last summer. And, um, we didn't charge anybody and we're doing a similar thing this summer that's being paid out of ESSER dollars because it fits the, right. the scope we that's not gonna that money's not always going to do that and we're probably going to go back to what we were doing before but I don't want to not use those ESSER dollars so I'm not suggesting we don't use ESSER dollars right. I guess maybe my question is have we is there any example of an FTE that we've added that we've then taken away you talk about middle school principal gifted director, like, so coaches, like, so we've added in, all these positions. Have we ever, so that's a different thing. Like the summer programming is kind of, it's contained in that summer and we could not do it. I'm talking about an FTE. We added one and not. Well, you know, deputy superintendent, I mean, that's really. Just, no, we just moved no, it to. No, I, I, I think to. Take that away. We just changed the name of it. But we, but in, when we add an FTE, it's aligned with our um, enrollment numbers, right? When we're, we're adding. Um, so I, I think I'll answer Dr. Jade's question. I think the answer is no. Um, in general, our FTEs have not been uh, reduced. If something's been added, I believe you would see some repurposing. Mm -hmm. uh, as, as an example, through our last strategic plan, we had, um, I want to say they're called teacher leaders, but now we've repurposed them into teacher coaches. So teacher leaders, and I may not be using the right term for those, but um, they were from a previous strategic plan repurposed in this ne next one. So um, the I think to answer your question, I've not seen an, an evaluation of, um, of maybe a new hire or a new FTE on that back end. 
Let me ask this. If, if we have like, have we, it seems to me that if we have like a, a bubble of kids coming through a particular elementary school and we, I think what I've seen over the years is, you know, the third grade class is really big. And then the next year, the fourth grade class is really big. Do we sometimes through attrition? Yes. Um, teachers to teach other grades. Cor or? Correct. You'll see some grade level movements um, here and there. And um, you may not see, so I, I think I was addressing Dr. Jay's question, maybe on the programmatic side, um, classroom teachers, I think works a little bit differently Different. um, where it's, it's really easy to um, absorb through attrition, retirements, resignations, when, when you get into the, the meat of in, instruction classrooms. Yeah. And we did. I, I don't want to belabor it, but did we do something about Spanish? Did we make some changes to our offerings? Cor correct. Yes. So we did decide to not, you know, we have made some tough decisions. Yeah, that was, around. that was small. Yep. Yep. Financially small. Yep. I should say. I'm wondering, and I think I put this in the notes that I shared with you earlier, is that when we engage in the strategic planning, the strategic plan should align with our priorities, much like the language, right? So if we've said these things are our priorities, our money should also align with our priorities. So I think part of the strategic planning process should also include an equity audit that says, what are we spending money on and who, right? And, and, and how does that play out by the demographics of grade levels, of special programs, of all those different things? Because I don't know, I think we, have added things. I'm not sure that we're always making sure that what we're adding and what we're doing is in alignment with who we say we are. And Kyle, this may be jumping ahead, but you, in your forecast, you have the four that we're going to start paying out of general revenue funds, I should say, instead of the federal dollars. But then you've also added additional FTEs per year. And that I think you added one. And how did you base that assumption? Yeah. So if, if I could have a small pipe polite correction. I, I try not to call it my forecast. Sure, I, do the, yes, I do the work. Forecast. It's a reflection of us, right? Um, so um, I say that now because it looks good. If it looks bad, I don't want to. <laughs> um, but no, so to answer your question, um, how do I determine uh, or we determine yeah. um, where FTEs may come and go? So as an example for this year, um, it, it, if it can go on a grant, we kind of look at the grants first because we like to spend other people's money first, right? Um, and if it can fit within the parameters, we will um, put them there. Uh, at, as an example, if, if we need uh, an additional third, fourth, fifth grade somewhere as a classroom teacher, that's hard to fit on a grant. Um, but if you're doing something with, with gifted or special education, um, or social emotional learning, those fit a little bit better on, on grants, grant specifics. Okay. So we look to grants first and see what's allowable and, and what our needs are. And then if it's not, if it's still as valuable to us as a district for general fund, we'll put them on there. Okay. So um, ESSER dollars have a little more flexibility than what we've seen in previous federal grants. Um, so we are hiring, I believe, three new additional FTEs this year with ESSER dollars, two, maybe three, um, and then coming back on general fund in FY25, yeah. Which, again, we budget to absorb that expense and through, for example, when we do strategic planning and we, we are determining, you know, hey, is this how we want to spend these dollars? Does it align with what we have strategically said are our pillars, our values, whatever? Um, then we put, we're able to absorb that into the budget. And it's, meanwhile, we've banked those dollars because we didn't spend them yeah. when we were spending the ESSER dollars, correct? Yeah. So, so what you're saying is in the absence of ESSER dollars, had we not gotten any ESSER dollars, we would have paid for a talent development specialist, a psychologist, and an intervention specialist if we didn't have any of those dollars. We, if it fit on our five-year forecast and we could fund it, sure. Why? Well, 
I want to be careful when we say, does it fit on the five-year forecast? Um, because we've had years where we've had large enrollment growth um, and the forecast may have had two, but we needed three. Right. So I don't want it to um, tie us down to saying the forecast sure. only has two. Um, but but yes, um, at the time of the talented and gifted discussion in January, the plan was for that to be a general fund expenditure. As we looked into the allowances of ESSER, um, we believe that is a, an expense there. And so like it, at the example, time- with the school psychologist, we hired that with the understanding that we prioritized, um, district prioritized, mental health and well-being and wellness and we recognized that the number that we had total number of psychologists we had was not enough to absorb the the need and so we looked and said we could hire this additional person correct and that school psychologist was from a year ago that we've not been able to fill and and am i right that you know sort of to dr jade's question this is part of why you're proposing that we take the levy out a year. This is part of it, yes. Because we have been able to not because yeah, spend. We'll be, so yeah, we're spending. We otherwise would have on. Yeah. So our total ESSER funding over the beginning of March of 2020 to the expiration of these funds is over $2 million. So it's now had COVID never happened, there'd be quite a few expenditures that right. weren't right. going to be on our books, right. but something like a psychologist um, probably would have been mm -hmm. because we, we saw that need coming, yes. um, but we're allowed to use COVID dollars. So we will. Mm -hmm. And we've, I think we've been um, prudent in those dollars as well. I mean, we, we don't spend unless we we see a need or we, I don't believe we're wasteful as a district with any dollars. Um, so I think we're fortunate to have created some plans or some discussions um, with these dollars. And um, as I reported at the state of the community ad address um, a month or two ago, we'd only spent 25% of our allocation. So we still have some to spend. And I believe these um, three new positions this coming year will be able to to live on ESSER dollars for um, at least two years and still have flexibility should something come up um, for the needs of our students or district. Awesome. Um, if you graph the, the expenditures out, not much different. Um, then the, again, the, the red line, which you really can't see is based on the November forecast. Um, not much different, but you would expect expenditures to be higher um, than the previous year. Cumulatively, um, revenues over expenditures. Um, so this is kind of cash flow over the school year. We have high points of when we have collections, July is one, January and February are another. Um, important note, uh, it, May and June are $0 revenue months. Um, so negative cash flow of six to $7 million. So when someone says, if they just look at April's cash balance, they think, well, that's really high, but um, we're gonna bleed six to 7 million at least on that in the next two months. So that, that goes to investing and, and um, laddering your investments. So we, and we, we do that. So here, here's the summary page of the forecast, minus all the um, lines in between. Total revenues, total expenditures, the, the thicker high, uh, blue line is, is kind of what I look at when I look at a forecast at the very beginning. And are you bringing in more money or are you spending more money? Um, it may be alarming if you've never seen a forecast, um, those negative numbers in uh, fiscal 23 through 26, but for a district like ours that uh, relies on our local funding, um, that's not abnormal. The further you go to the right, uh, the more har the, the harder it is to forecast. Um, the crystal ball gets really um, murkier, um, harder to see. 
Uh, and then the other blue line, 15.01, is our cash balance of uh, $24 million estimated this year and going down to 6.3 at the end of fiscal 26. So the good news is we still have cash on hand by the end of the forecast, um, but it is uh, it does, when there are financial troubles, it does take a while to correct them or um, react to them because um, mainly because we're a staffing type of organization. Uh, we deliver our services through staffing. Staffing decisions take time. Um, the two bottom lines are important um, metrics that we view from the Finance Advisory Council and I as a treasurer. They're not part of the, the official document that we provide to the state, but um, again, as a district that relies on our local uh, residents to support us primarily, uh, we like to keep an eye on that red line of what a, what a levy would take to break even um, or to erase our deficit spending, which is kind of what we did in 2019. Our nine mil operating levy at the time was estimated to be a break even levy. And if you go, if you go back, we, if this was a fiscal year, not a monthly, um, that step from December to February would look like a, a levy approval to get revenues above expenditures. So not a break even. Well, and that's where that that number of, you know, when we came to levy in 2019, um, as a district, nine years had passed. And just to get to where we are operating business as usual, that's the number that it we needed to be at millage wise. So we don't want to push all the way out to 20 from 2019 to 2026, because that's the potential millage that we would need to operate. Right. Does your, um, discussion, I haven't asked you this and I should have asked you before. D does your discussion in the um, finance committee meeting include considering a um, income tax addition? Uh, not at this point, because essentially what's, I mean, what's been reported um, prior to me speaking is our, the recommendation or suggestion has been to, to delay any income tax, or I'm sorry, any, any, any additional revenue. Yeah. So yes, that will be part of the discussion when the time comes to, okay, what do we do to um, uh, right our ship or, or correct our financial trajectory? Uh, yes, income tax will be part of that discussion. It, it was a good part of the discussion three years ago. I think it'll come up again. Thank you. We're a little bit more, um, th there's certain things with the income tax that we have to be careful of, timing as one. Um, it, it's more volatile. Um, it, it does play differently as a, as a resident. Um, right. and you're only allowed to go by cert, go up by certain increments. Whereas a, whereas a property tax, you can really, you can get really, really close, um, on your needs financially. It's a little bit of an equity issue, but it is an know. equity issue. Yes. Yep. yep which could come up in our equity yep. plan discussions or strategic planning, I, I'm not sure, but, yep. um, but yeah. Perfect, thank you. So the green line, it kind of speaks to the cash balance policy that um, you approved for a first reading. And to go back to that, it says at any point in these five years, I'm sorry, in the first four years, the cash balance drops below 70. Uh, would require a report or an evaluation from the superintendent and I on next steps. So if if that were inactive in in policy right now officially, we'd there would be no report because we'd be at 102 days um, within the first four years. Uh, we chose the first four because, like I said, the further you get out, the harder it is to forecast and. Um, should we see something in year four, it does give us enough time to uh, react and plan. And I was just gonna say, you already come to the board regularly and report things out, whether it be in the monthly and in our five-year forecast updates. Um, so this, with the policy, uh, adopting this policy creates, this is the, the time. When you see this number, you absolutely are coming to the board to have 
a, a more pointed discussion. Correct. Yeah. So um, what I believe will happen in November is will the fiscal 22 will roll off of the five years fiscal 27 will roll on if if everything remains the same that 44 will drop in within the four years in november when i uh when we present and how i envision that is that's november which will which will trigger the policy should it pass for a second reading uh we'll convene the finance advisory council to discuss it um and have recommendations um on on next steps so three years ago we kind of started that process in january had several meetings of the finance advisory where we discussed levy options i'm glad that we're having um we didn't stop talking about levy after the levy passed because i think that was the hardest um, part in the education process of just sort of re-educating because we had so many families that had turned over and new families in the community who didn't hadn't been here when we were on the ballot the last time and just sort of helping to um, keep pe people familiarized like here's the why this is what we're doing every every year and, and um, I think it makes it easier to help them understand when it comes time for them to make a decision about whether or not they want to support the levy or not yeah I think it's also important to look at that red line too. A um, little bit harder to put in policy because um, I like the idea of of keeping an eye on that because we none of us want a, to be surprised by a large levy um, in a three or four year time period. Um, so I think it's a metric that we'll continue to watch um, because that even though policy may say seventy days, if that number becomes uncomfortable, I think we've got to, to talk about it. Yeah, I, I appreciate us talking about that. Maybe, uh, that maybe, you, know, you might get that trigger, if you will, for under under 70 with the 44, but then if you look at the next line, it says 11 mil levy. So you may be too much of a sticker shock, if right. you will, to the community for that to even pass. So that now you have this like double whammy of your under 70 and it, it, you may not pass the levy. So now we're in a tough spot. Right. So can you just clarify your financial advice, the fi financial advisory committee is going to be next, when's their next meeting to start reviewing what the next options are for the levy? We'll probably have a couple meetings before that. Okay. Again, I think the cash balance policy will be triggered in November, most okay. likely. Um, but we'll we'll probably have another meeting or two before then, as we normally do. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think the the discussion on levy probably won't happen till January is my okay. um, would be my guess. We'll run through options. Um, we'll have some drafts. It was fun three years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Great group of um, residents on that committee. We've talked about cash policy discussion. I won't. I won't hit on that again. Um, we we reviewed the financial health and condition of the district. Uh, this um, one of these draft forecasts. I think you've heard me say I go through several drafts of these um, over about a two two and a half month period. Um, and as we budget uh, this spring, that also factors into this. Facilities was a discussion. Um, besides maybe the income tax revenue, keeping me up at night, facilities is the other reason. Um, for example, we're looking at roof sections of our Cassingham complex. They're not cheap. Um, you also have approved those recently of hundreds of thousands of dollars on repair. Um, it's I believe it's a concern financially for the district um, to continue down the path that we're on. So keeping in mind districts that have either built new schools or have drastically funded improvements or repairs have as have essentially saved general fund dollars, mm -hmm. which I believe and I think most others believe is designed and meant for instruction general fund is meant for our day-to-day in, in enriching the, the lives of our children. If we continue down our current path, facility repairs and maintenance will eat into that. 
Um, so I think it's something that it is something that we discussed in the facility or in the finance advisory council. We have the facilities advisory council getting ready to to gear up, but it's financially, I believe, it's something we cannot um, pull the wool over our eyes on anymore because it is um, it is starting to eat more and more of our general fund expenditures, which my belief should be saved for our kids and not walls and and respectfully board i will tell you um you know i mr heikenberry deals with me when i'm asking him questions about our our facilities and you know useful life of of equipment and plant um plant uh equipment but you know when i hear him say we're we're having we're forced to go out to amazon to order parts because the piece of equipment is no longer able to be, you know, procured. They don't make it anymore. It's obsolete, um, and we we're band aid fixing it. Um, because I work in facilities, <laughs> I see, um, you know, I have quite a few uh, sites that I'm dealing with, you know, where there was deferred maintenance before we we took it into our our fold and seeing how it balloons and, and not just a little bit, but balloons your purchase services expenses. And so when you say like it eats into it, I could see it overtake what we're trying to spend and what we need to spend in the classroom and for students if we don't have a very serious and, and focused approach on our facilities and the condition and, and improving it. And we cannot continue to Band-Aid fix them. And we had started on this process pre-COVID and we had to stop. So I think it makes sense that we understand why we didn't do it then, but I, you know, it's helpful for you to remind us that how important it is. Can I just ask a clarifying question? Were what, you, what was what you were saying that general funds should be used in, in the classroom, but that the levy would be focused on facilities, is that? So uh, uh, thank you for asking. Let me let me clarify, it's, I would say it's a belief in practice that general fund is meant for um, instruction, yeah. students. Like obviously there's gonna be a component of general fund for utilities and stuff whatnot. Um, but what, there are different types of levies. There's operating or general fund. There's bond levies for facilities. There's permanent improvement levies for facilities um, that are that help relieve the general funds um, expenditures on those sides. So I guess my point is if we continue to only use the general fund for repairs and maintenance and not ask, we, we could ask for just additional general fund dollars yeah. and maintain our facilities. Um, and, and maybe that's part of the next levy. Um, there's different ways to fund the buildings. And there's different ways to, to organize levies. Correct. Okay. But I, I guess if we go down our current path, um, if you look at our pie, maintenance and repair is going to eat more of that into instruction. Um, Especially as those facilities and equipment age. Um, and, right. you know, the more use that it's getting and they're working harder, they, they have a higher potential for failure. Yeah. And you're one catastrophic failure away from not being able to operate in a building. Yeah. So I'm going to say something in, in no way am I recommending us getting new facilities, but like brand new buildings. But I read an article today of a district who had a study done that said they're going to need $260 million worth of improvements over 30 years. Um, they could build brand new schools for less than that. That's not true for every district. It may not be true for us. It may not make sense for us. Um, but I think it's a discussion that is probably needed. Do we want to continue using general fund dollars and eating more into our instructional pie to maintain these facilities? Or do we need to do um, a, a large renovation or another 
type of levy to improve our facilities. On the facilities piece, you, in your forecasts, in your document, you said you increased it 5%. Is that typical of what you increased it by, or did you increase that more because of increased, cost the share? Increased it more because of inflation okay. um, and aging facilities. It's a combination okay. of both. Um, it, it, I mean, if you look in the news, inflation is 8%. Um, not everything is going up 8%, but um, it, it is a concern. So you took that into account when you did the forecast? Yeah. Okay. So we'd said three years ago that we'd be back. And as we all know, a lot's happened in, in three years. So, um, and at that time we'd said we wanted to get back on a more realistic um, levy cycle with a more realistic levy amount. Um, but since then, a lot, like I said, a lot's happened. Our income tax rebounded. Um, COVID stimu stimulus dollars are going to help um, alleviate some expenditures that we would have seen in general fund anyway. There's some expenditures that we've avoided because of COVID um, in that, in maybe the first six to eight months of it. Um, and as expected, conservative forecasting, um, which I think you would want as a treasurer. You wouldn't want me come saying I we we're spending way more. Um, I think you'd rather me come back and say we're we're spending less or our revenue is is coming in better. So based on that, um, this updated forecast that we have tonight, uh, we're confident that the 2000 funding can be stretched at least another uh, another year. Uh, and we believe it's important and this will allow our community to recover and heal from the last two years. It's been a tough, emotional two years on our students and parents and residents, whether you have kids or not. Um, and we'll have an updated strategic plan um, either be in the process at the time of this forecast and um, by a year from now, we'll have a much better lens or better crystal ball to know how that strategic plan is gonna drive us financially. Um, so a year from now, we think we'll have a, a better sense of, of our needs and we'll, we'll have the facilities advisory council um, uh, probably a year's worth of work from them to have an idea to not saying that we would have any type of facility um, issue on the ballot in 2023, but we, we can be prepared to probably talk about it better. I don't know if this would go to Dr. Jade or, or um, Dr. Fine, but um, with the strategic planning discussions, are we targeting for um, a 2023 um, launch to start the strategic planning or, or and have it completed yeah. by 2023? What's the timeline? The goal is, is we've started these conversations. It sounds like it's a six to 12 month process. Yeah. So as I'm listening to that timeline, this about this time next year, we would like to be finalizing a process, I would hope at the latest. When you talk to some of the consultants that that do this work, six months is really moving quickly. We wanna make sure we get it right as opposed to check in the box. Mm -hmm. It'll also be hel helpful to, for our community to have access to our facilities plan before we ask them to fund it, so. Yes, yeah, so I was gonna right. ask yeah. with the strategic plan, we're gonna ask for a master's master facilities plan. So. I would imagine as we have these conversations, Kyle and I talk quite a bit, I would imagine a strategic planning process will fit very nicely within a master's planning facilities process as well. Strategic planning process. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. So I love a good emoji, um, or I guess that's an eye emoji maybe. Um, I'm not Quinn, is that, it's not an emoji, is it? Um, look, um, I think it's a clip art, clip art. It's, <laughs> it's right next to the emojis. Um, I'm, I'm showing my age, wow. Um, but always keeping an eye on this graph with uh, revenue expenditures and the, this year our revenue is gonna be above expenditures projected. Um, but next year is that year when we start spending into our cash reserves and spending down. So um, as that red line goes above that blue, the, the green dips down. And you're projecting uh, flat revenue. 
for the next couple of years to play a safe. Yeah, so um, conservatively um, keeping income tax at a at a one percent increase year over year. Again, that we we've seen some fluctuations there. Um, it, it's really never it's never been less than five percent increases. It's kind of odd, but sometimes it's eight, sometimes it's ten, and we've never seen dips of five percent. We've seen dips of eight. 20%. So 1% um, in that middle. Um, uh, and again, property taxes don't grow with um, increases in values because of House Bill 920. So relatively um, a flat um, revenue line. Um, Mr. Smith, so if we go back to ballot, say in 2023, and then commit to a three-year cycle on levy, when we hit that 2026, Ideally, we're going to um, be able to just be at that sort of um, operating business as usual. It's not going to create a surplus because I think that was the other thing. Like our levy didn't necessarily bump us up with a bunch of cash afterwards. It just allowed us to keep, continue to operate. So I'm just curious if we go in 23, come back in 26, we're just maintaining status quo. We're not creating a surplus, correct? Next we'll year. we'll see like that that'll be a discussion uh for the finance advisory is um three years ago it was a nine mil was was a lot and probably didn't want that that stair step where revenue jumped above expenditures gotcha. um uh, to briefly answer i think that'll be a discussion for the finance advisory okay. to say all right is this a is this a break even type of levy or do we feel like there's room or an appetite from the community to go a little bit more a little like a cushion. traditional levy looks like? Oh, can you explain it to me? So um, districts, when they go to levy, don't just ask for what they need to operate. They ask for cushion. I would say traditional levy, if it's a three-year cycle, is year one, is there surplus, surplus Year two is a break even. Year oh, three is a deficit. It's a deficit. If and it's then a, they come back. And then they come back. Oh, I see. That, that's a very simplistic view of it. No, I like it simple. <laughs> um, we we had um, we were starting from a point that we could live with a break even levy. Mm -hmm. hmm. I would only just because you remember when we were sitting in June, when we got that big state cut, what was it like $625,000? Yeah. Um, that when we start looking at that number, um, we, we had to move people around so that we didn't terminate positions from just losing. I don't want to make it sound like a small number. It was a big number. It would have had um, significant impact on our organization in terms of loss of personnel after we just passed the levy to operate as usual. So we might want to be looking at that surplus spend deficit model versus just operating. So that might be something to bring to the council to have them wrap their head around. That's a good thought. On the other hand, if we've got to go out for a bond levy at the same time. Yeah, that's true. You know, so it's just what what do we need the money for? What are we, you know, yeah. So we talked in the advisory council, um, a little off topic, but to talk about facilities in two different ways, there's, there's maybe uh, the water heater type of bond where it's not impactful to kids. So, I mean, obviously they need, need warmth. Uh, yeah. need warmth. Right. Um, and then there's the educational yeah. environment right. type of bond facilities. And is that, are those married together in a bond issue or are they separate? Um, it, it might depend on the educational piece first. If, if there's massive changes, it's, just going to be part of it. If it's not massive changes, maybe you separate them out because if if we come out of this and say we're going to keep our existing facilities, we probably need a long-term 
maybe permanent improvement type of um, option. And, and I th as I recall, we talked about that too, when we were just beginning to think about these things back in the beginning of 2020, and then we had to change our focus. But other questions for Kyle this evening? I apologize for the lengthy. No, it's awesome. Time. It's so helpful. I, and um, I really appreciate the information that you have, you know, as, as Dr. Baker said, the summary that you provide for us in this document makes it so much more understandable. And I came and met with you to go through this stuff. And I appreciate your time on that, too. I just want to take a moment to thank Kyle. We are really lucky to have I think the best in the business doing this work for us. And uh, I know I say it a lot, but I'm going to keep saying that I can't imagine the job without a Kyle Smith. So well done. Appreciate it. And it's Kyle is much more than the dollars when it comes to our community. So thank you. Kyle, I super appreciate like the budget for dummies, like the arrows and the color coding, like it is and the donuts. incredibly helpful, right? Donuts. Yeah. The donuts, all that makes it, possible for me to sort of understand thank you do you have other items that you want to talk about before we go down to the recommend to approve recommendation to approve these items kyle no i think i would just um ask if there were any questions Okay, um, hearing none, uh, our item 5H is a recommendation to approve items 5B through G. Can I have a motion to approve those? So moved. Thank you, and a second? Second. Thank you, and um, any further questions or comments about any of those items? All in favor of that motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Same sign. Thank you, that motion carries. We are now up to public participation. The board welcomes the opportunity to hear from our community members. We encourage your participation within certain parameters. When you come to the microphone, please state your name and address. Our policy requires that you limit your comments to five minutes. Public participation is an opportunity to be heard, but it is not a Q&A session with the board. I am responsible for the orderly conduct of the meeting and the appropriateness of the subject matter being presented. Our public participation allots five minutes to each person wish wishing to speak until we've reached a total time of 30 minutes. Speakers aren't required to use the full five minutes, but when we get to the 30 minute mark, if there remain community members who have signed up but not yet had an opportunity to speak, then we can entertain a motion to increase the amount of time. So when you come up to the, um, Kyle will call you up. Um, please state your name and address. And we, do we have our five minute timer? Great, perfect. Kyle. First is Larry Diatley Ellison. Hello, everyone. Thank you for allowing me to be here tonight. Uh, I'm Larry Diatley Ellison. I'm at 46 North Roosevelt Avenue. And I uh, wanted to start off really quick and say thank you, Mr. Smith, for clarifying your comment on the loss of Spanish in the elementary as being small financially. I think if you talk to a lot of elementary parents, they would think the impact of the loss of Spanish as being a large impact. So thanks for clarifying financially. Um, I'm here tonight because I wanted to talk about sense of belonging um, as a parent of a middle schooler, soon to be a high schooler. Uh, my husband, Brian, and I um, have been a little frustrated by the lack of transparency with Bexley City Schools when it has come to panorama sense of belonging data. Um, Alana Spector provided comments last month in the board meeting regarding the presentation by Ms. McMaster's in the November board meeting. Um, 
presentation that I can I personally consider to be somewhat misleading. Um, I understand that the official response from the school is that the data was accurate. Um, I would just like to say I think accuracy and um, being misleading are not mutually exclusive. Unless someone's willing to offer a better explanation, this is um, how I see it. Um, using the percentile on which Bexley City Schools fell in comparison to national data of suburban schools at the grade bands that were displayed and assuming low rates of poverty on a slide simply titled sense of belonging and school climate is misleading at best. The slide cannot stand alone and it has to be supported by the narrative that Ms. McMasters gave during the board meeting. So not only would parents that are interested in this information have to have access to the presentation slide materials, but they would also have to have access and watch the video to match up her comments along with the presentation materials in order to get the full story. I think this is unacceptable and I think we can do better. Transparency would have been including text that explicitly described the data that was presented on the slide with all the caveats that were included in Ms. McMaster's comments. Even going back to September 2021 board meeting where Drs. Boyle and Abraham presented panorama data, the data was not presented or visualized on the recording of the board meeting, nor were the presentation materials provided. Makes it very difficult for parents to assess what's really going on, and that's uh, my request for transparency. I think the issue is broader. Um, as a parent, I don't really understand the focus on per national percentiles and how we fall or relate to other school districts nationally. As a parent, I wanna know what my child is experiencing in my school district. And I feel like the sense of belonging and school climate data, we need to understand as parents what our school is experiencing. I think better transparency would be providing that data to parents um, rather than forcing them to request FOIA requests to get the data. Um, I searched the Bexley City School website for a sense of belonging and I got 16 results. Um, out of those 16 results, four of the results had the actual word sense of belonging in it. All were just references to sense of belonging, not an actual, uh, not actual data on the sense of belonging or school climate, nor was there um, a visible plan on improving those items in the school. As you are aware, I ran for board, uh, board of Education last fall with uh, three of you included. And I know um, that during our campaign, uh, Ms. Pickerel was very um, insistent on her focus being sense of belonging. Um, I hope that you join me in uh, a commitment to improving on our students' sense of belonging. I'm here to ask you today to publicly address Bexley students' current sense of belonging and school climate data what plans are in place to address the gaps that are identified in that data, the resources that are assigned to those tasks, and the date on which we can expect an update with any results that can be shared. Finally, um, not in my prepared remarks, but I would like to say bravo for the selection of Ms. Nicewander as principal for Maryland. My son spent four years at Maryland, and out of all of the staff that he encountered during those four years, Miss Nicewander was the one that, if you asked him, had his back and stood up for him. And so I think she's an excellent choice, and you all made a very good decision with that. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate your engagement. Next, Regina James. Hello, everyone. My name is Regina James. I live at 2725 Allegheny. Um, and I guess I'm here to ask some rhetorical questions since it's not a QA. and a um, <clears throat> Make a long story short, um, my daughter here beside me, she's a ninth grader at Bexley, Element, at Bexley High School. She's been going to the district since third grade. Um, February the 8th, 
she was assaulted in the cafeteria by a young gentleman, which will remain nameless, choked, dragged, and dropped unconscious. Um, Dr. Fine is very aware of this situation and we spoke of, we've had many meetings and there's an investigation that is going currently. And he has reassured me that the situation is being taken care of as expeditiously as possible. Um, and he knows just from personal email correspondence with me and him that I'm getting quite anxious being that this happened February the 8th. Um, and I do feel like this needs a bigger audience um, because <laughs> I'm trying to hold back my emotions about it. Um, the issue with this situation was um, this was not um, initially seen as an assault. Um, and I had to advocate for her in order for the district and the administrators that are in question here to, that was handling this to see it as such. In a personal meeting with Dr. Fine, I posed this question to him directly. Um, I said, Dr. Fine, and my daughter plays volleyball with his daughter. And I said, Dr. Fine, if this was your daughter, do you think it would be acceptable for your administrator to tell you, and I quote, we will finish our investigation and call you at the end of the day after this vicious attack is on tape in a cafeteria, which I would like to point out that she was left, nobody helped her, not a staff member, not a student. And when this was investigated, the perpetrator was said that he was joking around. After I called the police, the police was then discouraged by the administrator. After I called the police the second time and then decided to call Dr. Fine because he was not aware of the situation, he obviously encouraged me to call the police. And I'm gonna skip past a lot of other details in this because there's a there's an investigation going on and it's my understanding that if I'm not happy with the results of this investigation that I can appeal to the board. So eventually, you know, I definitely wanted you guys to see me, see my daughter here. And a lot of you may not know by looking at me that my daughter here, her grandmother is Caucasian. <laughs> She has blue eyes and she has blonde hair. And when I told her that this happened to her granddaughter at this district, her response to me was, this was not happen if she was white. I wanna also say this young man was not immediately moved. This happened at lunchtime. He was allowed to stay in the school for the remainder of the day and come back the next day until I called the police the second time and had the officer demand to see the video surveillance, which at that point, he had to educate the administrators on what the definition of an assault was after this particular administrator quoted to me, the Ohio Revised Code, which he believes by definition that my daughter was not assaulted verbatim is what he said when I asked him what he would consider this to be. He says school violence or fighting, but he would let me know at the end of the day. Two things, my time is up. I do believe that my daughter was discriminated against by this administrator and along with bullied. Um, by definition, discrimination, the act of making or perceiving a difference. Um, in this case, I don't understand 
why my daughter's pain was not validated. Um, and it was not seen to be as bad as anybody else's. Bullying, abuse or mistreatment of someone vulnerable by someone stronger. And it's my personal belief that this administrator did use his, he had the opportunity to protect my daughter um, by removing this assailant, doing some other things, which he chose not to for whatever reason, I don't know. Um, and hopefully um, Dr. Fine um, would be able to bring some understanding to that question. Um, it is May. Um, and me and Dr. Fon has been, and he's helped me out a lot in this situation. And I'm not going to go take too much time more because I want Chase to be able to speak. Um, but that's basically why I'm here today. Okay. Um, hello, my name is Chase. And um, as my mom already said, I am a freshman in high school, and I've been going here for quite a amount of time in this district since third grade. And as someone who's been a part of the community for so long, um, I felt that I belonged. Um, but after this situation has happened, and I was assaulted, I walked into the main office expecting um, support. But instead, it took my mother to come down here and fight for me instead. And I didn't get the help I needed or the support from my teachers. Um, I, um, in result of this, I had a concussion and had to sit out from track and miss out on a lot of opportunities that I wanted to partake in, but um, I was not able to. Um, and most of the teachers had to be reminded by um, the principal in the main office what I'm going through multiple times. Um, it seems like everyone forgets the pain that you go through, and I just feel like people should care, especially as someone who goes to this school and as someone who's such um, a part of the community, and I was just disappointed. I expected so much more from my peers and the people surrounded by me. I felt like I was victim shamed by my peers and administrators that I wasn't allowed to feel the way that I feel, um, and I feel like that should not have happened. The only person who has validated my feelings was my mother and my family. Um, and every day I have to come to the school thinking that I um, am I'm safe in this building. But um, after this situation has happened, I have not felt that. And instead of coming to school excited to learn, I have to come to school um, just counting the hours, waiting to go home. And thank you. I want to say on behalf of the board that I'm very grateful for your coming in today. I know it is hard. I can see how hard it is for you to tell us these stories that this to tell us about this that you're explaining to me. I'm really grateful that you have had the conversations that you had with Dr. Fine. I I know it's a, a, a lengthy process and. I know Dr. Fine is continuing to, or will continuing to be continuing to look at this situation and move it along. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you, thank you Chase. Thank you. Regina, thank you. We ready? Miss Spector, thanks. Sorry, I think I'm with Victoria on this one. That just breaks my heart in a million pieces and you all know exactly why, because you know that my child experienced something very similar. Uh, Alana Spector, 2444 Fair Avenue. Um, I don't have a lot to say today. I'm here because I wanted to talk about the school response to my comments from last month. Uh, I didn't get a response until yesterday, and only through a FOIA did I get a response. 
And what's incredibly disappointing about this response is that the district seemed more interested in misaligning my character with false narratives than actually owning the data and addressing it. I'm certainly not going to go point by point, um, but things that stuck out to me is where the district says that if you control for the neutral responses, only an average of 16.4% of students answered in the negative. It, it, it's a, a meh response. That's not what we're aiming for. The survey itself defines what's favorable. It was 50%. We should own it. We should acknowledge it. We've known this data since at least last September. I was going to echo what Larry said. The September meeting where it was presented, it's focused on the presenter, not the screen. Their slides were not attached to the agenda. There was no way for us to easily follow. And I can tell you, they did not discuss high school sense of belonging. In, in verbally, I couldn't tell you what was on the screen. I, I was just incredibly disappointed because we've had this data since September. And I want as a community member to know, where can I see the action items that we've put around? Have we set a goal? Where do we want our sense of belonging to be? What action items have we created to get us there? What metrics are we using to measure if we're getting there? And where can I find that? Where as a community member can I find that? Rather than misaligning me, that's where the attention should have been focused. And it's very disappointing. Um, I, the things that bothered me here, what I said was that Mrs. McMaster's presented, uh, picked, handpicked her choice for this committee of adults who make up the input to the special ed committee. What I, what I was, I also said was that I, despite speaking to my friends, I never found anyone that was on the, on the committee. What they seemed to hear was that I'm upset that, my, that I and my friends weren't on the committee. That isn't what I said, that isn't the problem. The problem is that we don't have an independent auditor and they are very well aware that ODE and state support team can come in, they can pull IEPs, they can pull PRO1s, they can pull ETRs, they can pull all of our processes and see if we're in compliance. And that's the type of oversight that I believe we need because we're not gonna to get to the root of the problem. If you have 19 faculty members on this committee, not including Dr. Fine and 16 family members with no criteria as to how any of these people were pulled and, and given this opportunity, a survey that there was no criteria as to who was going to be using this data and how, the, these were the things I said, not I'm upset that I and my friends were not selected. I'm saying that you need an impartial auditor at the top to use this committee to find out what's really wrong. And I'm urging you to go to your friends, go to the people you know that have kids in special ed and ask them three questions. Number one, do you think your kid is getting the education that they need and deserve? Number two, do you think that you need a lawyer or an advocate to get what they need? And number three, does your kid feel like they are heard, seen, and belong in our district? Just ask, it doesn't have to be just me, thank you. Thank you, I appreciate your engagement. That's all. That's all, thank you, Kyle. So our next Topic is the board resolution. Um, let me just make an introductory comment on that and see if I can get my computer back on. Um, so typically our board has not taken a position on potential legislation. Um, as the board has seen in the proposed resolution, 
board policy BI sets forth that the board recognizes the importance of sound and constructive state legislation in establishing support for public education. And that policy makes it clear that it is appropriate for the board to be concerned with legislative proposals that affect education. That policy also provides that the board's legislative liaison to the OSBA board on state legislative proposals, we should, that I should inform the board about them and communicate our positions to state representatives and senators. By this resolution, the board would be making a public statement in opposition to three bills that are making their way through the legislative process in Ohio legislature. These bills seek to undermine local control of our schools and to dictate teaching practices that are directly counter to what we seek to do in our district. Our board is made up of locally elected officials and we have previously made an independent determination in policy INB related to the study of controversial issues. We have determined that our students have the right, among other things, to study any controversial issue that has political, economic, or social significance or concern. They have the right to study under competent instruction in an atmosphere free from bias and prejudice. And they have the right to form and express their own opinions on controversial issues without jeopardizing relations with teachers or the school. In considering to make a statement in opposition to House Bills 616, 322, and 327, we would be joining many other districts and school boards who have made similar statements. And we would be joining with our Bexley Education Association, which has issued a statement from its leadership in opposition to these three bills. I am very grateful to everyone who has had a hand in preparing the draft resolution that we are reviewing this evening. And I'm ready to open the discussion on what we have in front of us tonight. I'm happy to do that. Yep. Um, I'll entertain a motion to approve the resolution. Thanks so much. And a second. Second. Thank you. Discussion. Ms. Powers, I know I um, requested that when we send this uh, resolution forward, that it includes not only um, our policies that we reference, but our equity policy as well um, with a brief, brief um, letter. And I don't know if you need to, if you need help in drafting that, but that just is outlining why we are taking this stance because we have historically never taken a stance such as this. Um, and I, so we have an engaged conversation in this way um, with our legislature. Uh, so I do think it's important for them to understand we didn't just arrive to this because we don't like what you're doing. This is who we are. This is what we value. Um, and what you're doing is, is not accepted. Yes. Okay. Yes, um, you did ask for that. Um, and I'm happy to put something together that I could sign on behalf of the board. And I would send it, I would ask Kyle to send it along with a resolution that we might approve. Other comments? I just wanna thank you for, this was a lot of work and there was a lot of input from a range of perspectives. And I know that it was challenging at times. And so I appreciate your willingness to take into account multiple perspectives um, and take the lead on something that required an enormous amount of time. So I just wanted to sort of express that appreciation. Thank you. I'm really grateful for the documents that we had that provided us a starting point. I had input from um, the BEA's leadership. I had input from um, Mr. Braxton. I had input from board members and it, you know, it was a process where I was just getting other people to help. So 
I don't I don't get credit, but I'm I'm really grateful that I got that much input on it. Yeah, and I'm very grateful we were able to do all these bills in one resolution as well. Um, not the same exact bills, but um, it, it's a strong stance. And thank you for working with the BEA. It's something I'd asked you to do after the first draft. Um, and I think that makes it all that stronger too. Yeah, and as you know, not only was this discussed at our Franklin County School Board Member Alliance meeting, um, this is something as Dr. Fine knows I've been wanting to bring forward for a while, but I didn't really have to reach out to these other folks. They reached out and said, what are you guys thinking about doing? How can I get involved? So I feel like we come to the table on this um, with the support of our various um, stakeholders and the people that are doing the work. I know our students are engaged on these very issues um, and are planning to make their views known. Um, our teachers are engaged and have through the leadership of the BEA made their views known. And I feel like it's um, a great opportunity for us all to make a statement. Our statements are a little different, but they all are in opposition to these bills for the reasons that we've expressed in our collective resolution. Yeah, I've had many conversations with several students, several staff members who I know are very appreciative of, of the, the conversation and the stance. That's great, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate this as well. And, and just some of the conversations I've had uh, with other school board members in other districts and you know this kind of, uh, as we call it, encroachment, if you will, you know, or even an erosion of the role of the teacher in the classroom. And, and so this, um, you know, just, you know, even having the anti-racist kind of stance, you know, not just going along with things and, and being an advocate in different ways. Uh, so, so I, and being succinct as Joanne kind of referenced it here with three three bills in one we don't know if there's a fourth one coming you know the, where the traje trajectory is going uh but but we know where beckley stands so and putting the three bills in that was a you know i had been thinking about these other two bills and then bill 616 came into being you know in april here in ohio um when dr jade and i were on our last call with the Franklin County School Board Association, member association. Um, one of the um, members of that group noted that her district had put a, a statement out, but it was only on 616. And um, she was a little conflicted that it hadn't addressed all three of them. And that was helpful to me to remember that they all, they all hang together in a way. They all address the same issues. Um, and so I'm grateful that we were able to, you know, there may be another one, there may be more, but where we are right now. So um, if any other comments or questions? Great. Um, and I, before I say this, I just wanna say that I, I know that there's a lot of work going behind the scenes with many students and like student advocacy groups, but I want to say that I generally based on conversations I've had with students, there's an overwhelming consensus and, and support of what you guys are doing. Um, I think students generally don't want to be sheltered from different difficult conversations. They want to be able to talk about things that may make them uncomfortable, but I think these are conversations that we need to have <clears throat> to prepare students for the real world and for college or whatever they choose to do after high school. That's great, thank you. I, I just love having that voice in this room. Um, and, um, you know, this, this is our, our primary focus is what we do to uh, teach children in our district. And um, I think it, in here somewhere that we need to be able to continue to, to teach what's true. Okay. Everybody in favor of um, the passing the resolution, adopting the resolution, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. That motion carries.
Last thing we have, anything, um, may I have a motion to adjourn our meeting? Um, so moved. Good, good question. Um, a second? Second. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. We are adjourned. <laughs>